Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Red Rapper Writes. Today we're back to reviewing another dinosaur documentary solely on the basis of scientific accuracy and ranking it accordingly. Previously, we've explored the creatures in Walking with Dinosaurs and The Ballad of Big Al. Now we're moving away from the BBC shows to cover a patriotic take on the subject, when dinosaurs roamed America from discovery. The 2001 film seems like a fan favorite since it's gotten several mentions in the comments and I can see why. Even if it doesn't have the same production value or storytelling skills as the Trilogy of Life, it makes some key improvements to help progress portrayals of dinosaurs even further. Plus there's John Goodman's wonderful narration. Now we'll see what this documentary gets right, wrong, and how it compares. Let's dig this up. It's time to celebrate because one easy win for when dinosaurs roamed America is being the first documentary to represent dinosaurs with full feathery coverings. <laughs> the full fluff comes in the New Mexico segment that takes place 90 million years ago on Nothronychus and an unspecified dromaeosaur. We'll talk about that later. Nothronychus is even shown with the right kind of feathers. Going off of Bapiosaurus, which was described in 1999, we know that Therizinosaurs had down feathers and simpler long filaments. This is pretty much what we see in the movie. The simpler looking feathers also appear on the Dromaeosaur, which is wrong. They would have had actual wings with flight feathers. Although future discoveries would continue to point to more advanced coverings on raptors, the discovery of Microraptor a year prior should have tipped off the creators enough to this. I also gotta give a shout out to plenty of the designs, not only can I tell what everything is supposed to be, but the creature models are actually starting to get a lot more lifelike. In Walking with Dinosaurs, yeah, I knew what everything was, but most designs were very... They're, um... Uh, inexperienced? Oh, they stink! Uh -huh. Here we see some animals to be proud of. Dryosaurus may have had feathers, but genuinely looks great. This interpretation of Ceratosaurus looks better than anything before or after it for another decade. Heck, the creators even gave it what looks like four fingers but only three claws. Plus a very stocky body, excellent. Beautiful, isn't it? In Big Al, I commented on how the sword pods looked like they had elephant feet. Well, not anymore. Time, effort, and research was actually put in to make sure these long necks look right. The front feet had five toes that formed a thick column with a single sickle claw facing inwards. Then the back feet looked rather turtly, with again, five toes but three claws pointing outwards. What Discovery brought here looks much better than sticking generic elephant feet on them. The Ceratopsian feet too, well, we don't get a great look at them, but I appreciate how the hind legs go straight underneath the body, while the front legs are somewhat splayed outwards like a lizard. The only time you'll hear me compliment a more lizard-like feature in dinosaurs. This was their way of adapting their unpronated hands from their early bipedal phase to walking on the ground as quadrupeds. Heck, I gotta mention their predator, the T-Rex. Paleontologists have been slowly doing away with Nanotyrannus over the years to being basically a fringe theory at this point. But even back in 2001, the creators of this film portrayed this dubious genus the right way as juvenile rexes. We get to see how young Tyrannosaurus had longer legs, a longer snout, longer arms, and faster speeds, but then morphed into thicker, chunkier adults. Nice. When Dinosaurs Roamed America was way ahead of its time in this regard. Now, I can go back to compliment the vast majority of dinosaurs in this dino doc, but I'll save you a few minutes. With a few exceptions, they look great. Also, I do enjoy the walking with style that emulates a real nature documentary, but I like how this one adds short segments that break up this format to deliver more information that couldn't have been delivered otherwise. Being 20 years old, it makes sense that new discoveries have changed our outlook on certain dinosaurs and the world in which they lived. One point that comes up in this documentary, and that we've seen previously, is that dinosaurs and pterosaurs were already on their way out at the end of the Cretaceous, that they were struggling to make it until the meteorite put them out of their misery. This simply isn't the case. We now know that there was far more biodiversity among non-avian dinos than we gave them credit for. They were doing just fine. 
Okay, so now that we have a T-Vex that actually looks like a T-Vex, we can get into more detail with it instead of pointing out the obvious. One recent study has been that of dinosaur lips. By comparing the skulls of theropods to modern day reptiles, an immobile lip condition seems to be the default setting for terrestrial creatures or tetrapods. This makes sense since, unless you're aquatic, Lips are needed to prevent teeth from drying out and being damaged. Crocodilians, which lack lips, have very specialized and notable features on their mouths that dinosaurs lack. On top of that, theropods, like Tyrannosaurus, have a row of what are called foramina going along the tops and bottoms of their mouths. These may have served as muscle attachment sites for lips. So it is much more likely than not that theropods had lips. One other interesting feature is the genus called Syntarsis, presumably Escayentacate. This early Jurassic creature has been a matter of debate for years. Firstly, the name Syntarsis was already used to describe a genus of beetle, so that doesn't work. Because two genera can't have the same name, both species of Syntarsis, Cayentacate, and Rhodesiensis fell under the new name Megapnosaurus. Soon after though, both species of now Megapnosaurus were synonymized with Coelophysis. So this poor creature we see in the documentary kept getting reassigned, but things only got crazier from there. For the name that got thrown out, Syntarsis, well, that genus of beetle was found to be dubious, so the name is free and ready to be used by scientists once again in reference to this early Jurassic predator. The latest study I could find came from this past January, and find Coelophysis bari, Megapnosaurus rhodesiensis, and Syntarsis cayentacate to each be valid. Gosh, I hate saying all these names. In the end of this long, drawn-out story, the Discovery Channel wins! Syntarsis may be a valid genus after all. <laughs> Continuing with our theropod theme, the Late Cretaceous New Mexico segment features a small dinosaur only described as a Salorosaur. Well, John Goodman was right about that. However, it has since been given a name, Susky Tyrannus. Formerly described in 2019, it turns out that our fluffy friend wasn't just a Solorosaur, but a Tyrannosauroid. Woo! Yeah, baby! Because Dilophosaurus doesn't make an appearance in any future documentary we'll be covering, unless I'm completely forgetting something, now is the only time we get to look at this fascinating creature. The Dilophosaurus model was mostly accurate for its time with its three clawed hands, reduced fourth digit, larger size often compared to a grizzly bear, and kink in the mouth. Overall, it looks like a solid Dilophosaurus, but a new 2020 study and comprehensive redescription has changed our view of the animal. The size of the kink is smaller than we thought, the lower jaw is thicker for holding struggling prey, and those iconic crests would have been much larger and rounder. Also, this idea has been around for a while, but it may have been feathered. A trace fossil of where a dinosaur rested has been argued to show feathery imprints and belong to Dilophosaurus. Despite its popularity, it's clear that there's still a lot we don't know about it. That's it for the interesting new studies. We've already covered several other subjects on this channel that come back around here. The necks of the Plotikids wouldn't have been that horizontal, Stegosaurus wouldn't have had that large a hip, and Anatotitan is no longer a valid genus, but is now considered a species of Edmontosaurus, e. Anectans. I don't mean to cut off the herbivores, but you can watch my previous documentary reviews for more on them. Thankfully for when dinosaurs roamed America, most of its problems were due to the scientific understanding of its subjects during the time it was made. Less thankfully, there are still some serious flaws here. First of all, there are some animation errors that make the dinosaurs look a bit wonky. Sometimes they bend their body in very strange positions. Then in the Hell Creek segment, the juvenile Tyrannosaurus is given the same height as the adults when compared to the Trikes and Edmontosaurus. It towers over its prey when it should really be dwarfed. Once again, our eyes are met with the pronated wrist position. Theropods in this documentary constantly switch between palms facing inwards and downwards when we know their wrists didn't have that level of mobility. Dinosaurs would have had their hands stuck facing inwards towards each other. Because they swap back and forth, it's like the creators are trying to appeal to both science geeks and mainstream audiences, which is fine in your typical Hollywood movie, but this is a documentary, it's supposed to be educational. 
the bar shouldn't be lowered for wider appeal. In the same vein as the wrists, once again we're met with the shrink wrapped dinosaurs. I know it's wrong, you know it's wrong, we've discussed it before, so let's move along, move along like I know you do. So, some prehistoric creatures throughout the various segments find themselves out of time and out of place. For some, it's only by 1 or 2 million years, so I won't nitpick that. The first segment in the Triassic stars Coelophysis and takes place 220 million years ago, around where New York City would spring up. I'm glad that we're on the cool side of the river, but this leads to some problems. Coelophysis didn't appear until about 4 million years later. Plus, its presence in New York, eh, I'll give it to you, Sully. No Coelophysis skeletons have been found in the state, but footprints that possibly belong to it have been found in Rockland County, just north of the city. The armored archosaur Desmatosuchus has the opposite problem. It's in the right time, but the wrong place. Only being found in western North America, mostly Texas. Hey Patrick, what am I now? Uh, stupid? No, I'm Texas! What's the difference? The Phytosaur Rudiodon though, right time, right place, right look, good job. The next segment has a similar problem since it takes place in Pennsylvania 200 million years ago. Look, I get that they want to include all of America and not just the West, but the creators just plopped the Kayenta Formation over 2,000 miles away from its Arizona home. Now, to be fair, trace fossils possibly belonging to Dilophosaurus, like footprints and that squat we mentioned, have been found on the East Coast, but that's not a good enough excuse to ship all these dinosaurs across the country. Also, the date is too early for Dilophosaurus and Syntarsis. 195 million years ago isn't exact, but would have been the best bet to get the Dilo, Syntarsis, and Ankysaurus all together. Outside of these two parts, time with space leaping dinosaurs isn't that much of a problem and can be forgiven. Another fascinating point is that of pack behavior in Tyrannosaurs. It has long been speculated that Tyrannosaurids, like Tyrannosaurus, would have hunted together in family groups to bring down tougher prey. This idea comes from a few examples of Tyrannosaurs being found buried together, most notably the Dry Island Bone Bed site, which entombed at least 12 Albertosaurus of various ages. When Dinosaurs Roamed America combines this idea with the fact that juvenile tyrants were faster and more agile than their parents, to create cooperative packs where the young chase prey into being ambushed by the stronger adult. This is all fun speculation, but we have to be careful with how much we infer from fossils. There are more likely explanations for why many Albertosaurus died together, like a flash flood or drought, and it's more likely that younger T-Rexes look different because they served a different niche by hunting smaller, faster prey, not because of wolf-like complex pack behaviors. A few more issues come with the documentary's portrayal of Triceratops, the prey that T-Rex is often shown hunting. One small thing that I noticed are the juveniles. They look too much like the adults in terms of their frill shape and horns. The horns on them would have actually pointed backwards in their youth and slowly shifted forwards as they grew up. And the frills would have been lower, being horizontal to the head. Also, the Triceratops we see in the movie form a large herd, which is common in their portrayals too. But although massive groups of other Ceratopsians have been found together in the hundreds, there is little scientific evidence that Triceratops itself would have engaged in this behavior as well. Small groups of a few individuals have been found together, maybe suggesting they move together, but so far, the extent of herding we see in the film can't be verified at all. Moving away from Hell Creek, the Ankysaurus we see get eaten by Dilophosaurus is a neat addition. We don't get to see many pro sauropods in media, but the size shown is far too big, be comparable to the predator hunting it, about 7 meters, when the actual dinosaur would have only been 4 meters at the largest. I promised earlier that I would mention this, so here it is. The biggest fault in the Dino Doc is the invention of a brand new raptor. What the hell? Some of the main dinosaurs we follow in the Zuni formation section are a pack of unnamed raptors. They're not named because they don't exist. Discovery must have wanted to feature dromaeosaurs at some point, so they just shoved them here despite no remains from this family being found. Guys, seriously? They could have just put the unnamed dromaeosaur in Hell Creek, where there were fossilized teeth of an unnamed dromaeosaur. Eels. Is it blow your brains out bad? 
No, but the creator should have known better than to just make stuff up. Now, I could have ended it here, but there is one more nugget of knowledge that I think it's time for me to give. I've been saving this one for a while. Dinosaurs couldn't roar. Yes, you heard that right. Dinosaurs did not roar, let alone give really edgy metallic screeches. Many sound effects given to them come from recordings of mammals like elephants, bears, and lions, which are not good representatives of what dinos would have sounded like. Mammals use the larynx to produce their loud noises, an organ not found in avian or non-avian dinosaurs. I'm sure they would have made their own unique sounds, especially hadrosaurs with their crests, but the roars that we're used to are not accurate at all. Perhaps bellows or hisses or booms would be more realistic. I'm sorry guys, but your entire childhood is a lie. Lies, 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 yeah. The Discovery Channel made a big step in the right direction with the 2001 documentary When Dinosaurs Roamed America. Not only do the dinosaurs look much more recognizable than before, and usually live in the right time and place, but feathers have been fully embraced for the first time. Watching this documentary makes me feel like real progress is being made, a trend that will continue until the late 2000s when filmmakers try to revert back to the totally awesome bro monsters from our childhoods. While there are problems, the vast majority of them are inoffensive or just due to us having more information in the present. John Goodman's voice alone could warrant an A+, but the ranking is based solely on scientific accuracy, so I'm gonna have to give When Dinosaurs Roamed America a B. If it wasn't for the made-up raptor, I could have easily justified a B plus, but... Oh, it is what it is. It is, it is what it is. <laughs> As you've probably noticed, I don't get around to covering every detail due to the sake of pacing. I don't want to keep you here forever. Some things I leave out or save for future reviews. So, if there are any compliments or critiques I missed, please let everyone know in the comments down below. And remember, if you enjoyed this video, to please leave a like, subscribe, and check out my social media. See you next time.